welcome to another fantastic, wonderful, spendiliferous episode of the One Year No Beer podcast. Today, I'm joined by somebody I've been trying to get in touch with for quite some time and finally got him to come onto the podcast. Lots of Instagram messages and finally got him to agree. Today, I'm joined by TJ Power. TJ is a neuroscientist. He has dedicated most of his life to psychology and understanding the brain. And he has now created an incredible program that follows the dose method. We're going to get into this, but we're going to talk about chemicals, neurochemicals. We're going to talk about our relationship with alcohol and the significance on the brain. We're going to talk about what happens from drinking a lot over a long period of time and how to change that. And then he's going to give you some amazing, amazing tools that you can introduce so simply into your day that you understand about your neurochemistry that is gonna help you change your relationship with alcohol. Not just that, change your relationship with stress, change your relationship with yourself. So this is a really, really powerful episode. And once again, I know I say this almost every episode, but once again, this is the science that we are using in complete control. So when we meet great people who are doing great things out there, that resonate with our science that is absolutely aligned we love having them on the podcast so i hope you enjoyed this as much as i did making it now let's welcome tj power well welcome to the show um so good to have you on i've been um admiring your stuff for a while and um seeing all the good work that you're doing out there so super exciting um, and i'd love it if you could take a bit of a moment now just to you know a, a, a amazing you know past story you have difficulty in 20s and I think a lot of people are going to resonate with your story. So why don't you give us a bit of background um, on you? So effectively played uh, high performance golf as a young kid. And that exposed me to the world of psychology and performance psychology very early from like eight, nine years old. So I discovered this world of high performance and then decided to study psychology at college. And it was the first kind of subject that I really connected with. I didn't particularly connect with the like school education. I found school fun, but not necessarily the education side. And then suddenly discovered psychology and loved it. Um, chose to study at university. And during that period of my life, also navigated quite a lot of difficulty. I had like five people pass away five years in a row in my life. So we, uh, it kind of matured my mind pretty fast and exposed me to the world of emotional pain and stuff like that. And Very traumatic. Yeah, for sure. I was just very young brain to be going through those kind of things. And I then, yeah, studied psychology at university, loved it, uh, went on to lecture at Exeter University and build my own kind of psychology and neuroscience education. And then went into research and became a neuroscientist. And then during COVID, I was kind of in that whole research lecturing space and thought, Maybe I could be teaching companies and schools and stuff like that, how to navigate the mental health challenges that COVID was creating and launch this company called Neurofy. And uh, yeah, over the last few years have trained a lot of people in our neuroscience-based method, how to feel a bit better. That's super cool. Um, and uh, what an amazing project you've got going on there and doing great stuff. So um, yeah, but you, during the 20s, and I mean, you rushed through some things there. We've covered a lot of topics. Um, you um, had a bit of a party lifestyle for a while, which I know my audience will resonate um, well with. <laughs> I did. I, I definitely was someone that was inclined towards the party lifestyle from a very young age. I mean, I was, as sad as it is, I was smoking cigarettes when I was about 12, 13 years old, super young, drinking vodka and having fun like that. And uh, then, pretty yeah. Pretty normal in the UK. Pretty, pretty, pretty normal in the UK. Like it's what the people around me were doing as well. And I would say then from like sort of 16 to 21, 22, really engaged hard into that lifestyle, got very into the party scene, lots of drinking, lots of partying and had its fun experiences within it, but also definitely came with its challenges and its lows and its demotivation and anxiety and stuff like that. And yeah, have been through a big process. I'm 26 now over these last kind of four years of really readjusting my relationship with all these fun things that you can engage with and it's been a journey and a journey that i've been very very happy to do it's led to a much more fulfilling happier more connected more motivated life now that i've got that stuff under wraps and yeah i'm happy to dive into whatever aspects of the experience you think could be cool yeah well um in interestingly um 
I guess, you know, talking about this relationship with alcohol, I'm curious uh, to, to hear a bit more about your relationship with alcohol. I know you've been through some iterations of stopping drinking for a while mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, then trying to control it and things like that. So, yeah, tell me a bit more about your relationship with alcohol. Yeah, I would say, so for context, almost a relationship for five years of close to drinking every day. Uh, and there, there were periods of time where a non-drinking day could be two or three pints. That would be a non-drinking day. And then there was days with significantly more pints than that. And when I was at university, I got very into the sports side of university and there was this big kind of social scene and it included a lot of drinking. So I was very immersed in that. I was actually the social sec, like I ran the events. So I was like kind of in charge of getting everyone charged up and partying and stuff. <laughs> and then, which was kind of fun at the time. That was basically yeah. my job too, so for too 13 much, years. Too much alcohol, that's for sure. And yeah. then I finished university. I finished my third year of university. I was going back to go to the master's and go into the lecturing. And I thought, right, this summer, I'm going to really get myself together. I'm going to get myself super clean, super healthy, fit, motivated. So then I had about three months of that period, no drinking. And throughout that next sort of six to nine months, really didn't drink much at all. I uh, said so very low drinking. I then came back to drinking a little bit. It was very hard. I was living in a house of university students that were all partying super hard. So it was very hard to not engage with it at all. And then drunk for another few years, like a little bit, nothing too crazy. And then last year I did seven months without drinking from uh, early in the summer, like uh, May sort of time, all the way through to January this year, which was really good. I think really helped me to adjust my relationship with kind of social life and drinking and in general led to me feeling really good. I cannot explain the joy that I experience when I wake up on a Saturday or a Sunday morning feeling really good. And yeah. it's like these are our two rest days, depending on how you construct your work, but these are our two rest days and they almost become like hangover recovery days and not yeah. <laughs> joyful rest days. And waking up on a Saturday morning and going for a coffee and sitting there feeling good is uh, so unbelievably enjoyable. So I, I love that. It Over the last sort of six months, I have had alcohol back in my life a little bit, but not really to the extent of like getting smashed and stuff like that. Yeah. And so when you were going through this journey, how much did the understanding that you were going through in the research and, and the neuroscience play into you changing your relationship with alcohol? Were you like self-analyzing and then learning about it and being like, well, I mean, why am I doing this and what's going on? And yeah. How much did that play into that? A huge amount. I, I've gone so deep into neuroscience and specifically neurotransmitters, things like dopamine and oxytocin, serotonin. And I've gone so deep into that world that I almost see the world through the lens of these neurotransmitters just because I teach it all the time. And I see my own experience of life through how my dopamine levels are right now, how my oxytocin levels are. And it's just a useful framework for me to construct my life through because if I'm high in these chemicals and I feel motivated and connected and confident and energetic, like I love that experience. I love feeling awesome. And the alcohol really hits the dopamine system extremely hard. And the low dopamine experience of feeling kind of apathetic and yeah, after drinking of uh, feeling apathetic and demotivated. And then if you really smash it, kind of like a depressed type energy in your mind, I hate that feeling and i do think my brain has an inclination to feel that feeling i don't just have like a natural super happy brain that always will feel amazing i really feel the hangovers i feel the the challenge it brings and i find the more i've deeply understood and connected to the feeling that it brings the more i'm motivated to not find myself in that experience basically yeah completely okay well let, let, let's talk about that so what does alcohol do to the brain from the neurotransmitter perspective yeah, so if we focus on the dopamine, dopamine is such an interesting chemical and it's become pretty famous in the modern world. I think people know that, oh, dopamine, yeah, that's like a happiness chemical. It makes you feel good. To give you some deeper context, effectively, the reason your, ha your brain has dopamine in it, the reason it evolutionarily developed within us is it basically is a chemical that creates drive to pursue activities that are difficult and then gives you a rewarding feeling if you're doing them. So if you're... Say, for example, we go back to the hunter-gatherer days, and I think it's useful to see neuroscience through evolution because our brain for 300,000 years was running around in forests and now it sits behind these computers. But it's really built for that original concept. And if you had a hunter-gatherer, 
Dopamine would basically give them drive and desire to want to go and hunt and build shelter and find food and explore new lands. It gives them the want to do it. And then as they did these things, found food, built shelter, it gives them a nice rewarding feeling. And the main, main thing to understand with dopamine is how it was developed. Is it something that's designed to be earned? You basically have to put in effort and then your brain gives you dopamine as a result. And therefore, dopamine follows this nice curve where Say, for example, we take a modern day activity, you need to do some focused work task and complete a project. Your dopamine will start building as you do that task. And it's not that easy at the beginning. And then gradually you're like, right, I'm getting more focused. And then you have a nice satisfying, satisfying feeling of I've done that task. And then it goes back down. And on a graph, your dopamine slowly rises, nice peak of feeling good. And then it slowly falls back down. Lovely. The difficulty we have now is We've always wanted dopamine. We've always wanted to find the food and build the shelter. However, over the last few hundred years, we created all these ways to hack the dopamine with the cigarettes. And originally things like brothels would have also been like a hack for dopamine to get dopamine from sex. So like cigarettes, alcohol, brothels, these kind of things a few hundred years ago. And then now we've furthered that with social media and drugs and junk food and stuff like that. But effectively, the biggest thing with alcohol is rather than earning pleasure, putting in effort and then feeling good, you immediately experience a huge, huge spike in dopamine. Um, when you drink alcohol, for example, as, once you ingest a drink, your dopamine levels will 2x. They'll effectively double. And it takes about 15 minutes to get there. So drink an alcoholic drink, your dopamine levels double. And after about 15 minutes of drinking it, and then because they've gone up so quickly, instead of like slowly earning the dopamine, they go up really quickly. The brain doesn't know any better than to try and rebalance it back to its baseline level just like if uh if your heart starts beating really quickly when you've seen a heart monitor in like a hospital show it starts beating quickly but it also beats really slowly and it starts going like this because it's always trying to counter and effectively what happens is you drink the alcohol you feel really really good and then the dopamine is like how do they get up here and then it starts to crash really hard and it goes below the baseline level and it will make you feel crap effectively and that repetitive cycle really quick dopamine crash really quick dopamine crash eventually causes this mechanism to burn itself out basically if you imagine it like if you had a manual car and every day you got in there and you revved the engine and didn't put it into gear you'd burn that engine out and effectively the alcohol is burning this dopamine mechanism out by giving us too much quick pleasure wow what is the actual effect of burning this dopamine system out what's the what what are, what are the signs well the dopamine system if we go back to the original is creating all your drive and your desire to do anything, to do your work, to bond with the people in your life, to go to the gym, to cook and eat healthy food. And if you burn the mechanism out, you start losing desire and want and motivation effectively. And from my perspective, I think mental health does, to have good mental health, it does require a certain amount of effort. And if people are, are struggling with like feeling like lethargic, can't bother to do anything, not pursuing the goals they want in their life, that is a real sign that probably your dopamine system is very burnt out. And it can create that kind of depressed, lethargic, apathetic experience, basically. Really interesting. What proportion of burnout do you think is the burnoutness of the dopamine system? In terms of humans burn out now? Yeah. That's... Yeah. So, is that, from what you said, it sounds like they're very, very well linked. So I'm wondering, I mean, if I think, uh, you know, I've recently been through a bit of a spite of burnout, um, but, you know, I, it's it's a low thing for me. Um, it, it, it just... You know, because I go at it like the clappers, um, and then I suddenly get to a place where I just need to take a breath, um, and I think that's what people call burnout these days. But uh, <laughs> basically, enforced rest, mentally and physically. Um, so um, yeah, I, I, if I think back to that, you know, obviously work is high, but you know, we I'm sure we get dopamine rush from from work, right? It's a similar sort of level of addiction. Well, I'm, my business is on part social media, so. Of course, there's a social media element to it. Um, I'm also doing deals. I'm I'm selling, and there's a dopamine part to that. So, yeah, there. Is, yeah, there's definitely two elements with the burnout piece. I think we are burning out this mechanism with all the, the quick pleasure. Social media would be a good example. When you look at burnout, it also interconnects with another one of these chemicals, which is serotonin, and serotonin is the, the chemical that's really responsible for your actual energy levels and your mood. And this chemical is being made inside your gut. 95% of it is being made in your gut. And the kind of things that are impacting your serotonin are your sleep, your nutrition, how much time you're getting out in sunlight, rest, your breathing patterns. 
And basically, I think a lot of people are very burnt out because that mechanism is actually not activating very well. People's sleep is off, their food is off, yeah, their totally. body isn't basically getting treated in a nice, natural, healthy way. So you've got like two elements of it. One is the quick pleasure stuff, burning out the desire and want. But then one is like the lack of like care for the body that's burning out the serotonin system. Yeah, amazing. Um, just before, because uh, it, I can't wait to get into the the daily dose and the dose system. It's such a um, it's a great concept that you're doing with Neurofy. Um, but just before I jump into that and go further deeper, just going back into the alcohol subject specifically. Um, so we've we've got this effect where you know two x rise in fifteen minutes, and then suddenly this crash and this repetitive use is burning out the system. So what happens to the brain over time? Um, if I think about my relationship with alcohol um and you know t i know tolerance goes up so you have to build tolerance um and so psychologically you can take i mean back in the day i could probably do 10 pints and still have you know completely clear conversations with people no problem because it was my job right i'd be drinking all day all night um, and still be able to function and remember stuff the next day you know psychologically i just didn't let myself get into a state where i forgot or didn't know what was going on because it was so critical to my role but then if I look at that relationship and then after changing my relationship with alcohol, now if I have a drink, I mean, you say depressed after a binge session, I'm depressed or, or low. I can get, you know, very, very low after just having one or two drinks. Um, so, yeah, let's talk about the evolution of the brain over time. What is it doing um, from alcohol perspective? Yeah, well, one of the challenges is it would have taken you a lot of drinks back then to get that significant dopamine rise. Whereas now, because you don't have much tolerance to it and you're not drinking that much, you will get a big sharp rise of dopamine when you have just one or two drinks. And that's why for you now, you could still get quite depressive symptoms just off of one or two. And I have the same, like I really notice energetically and my mood and my thought process is very significantly impacted off just a few drinks. And relatively speaking, it might have taken a five, six or seven or eight to achieve the same challenge of one or two that I have now. And it's just because, yeah, the dopamine is going to get a sharper spike effectively if it doesn't have it very often. Just like if you went and had a McDonald's every day, eventually the McDonald's wouldn't be that exciting. Whereas if right now I went and ate a Big Mac, I don't really eat Big Macs, I'd be like, fuck, this is really, really high dopamine. And I'd get a big spike off it. So it's just you build tolerance to the amount of spiking yeah. that can happen. That's great. And I guess that also is reassuring because it shows that when you do change your relationship with it, your dopamine system starts to to um, rectify itself. It starts to go back to a, a healthier state. 100%. You basically have in your brain what's called your baseline dopamine, the amount of dopamine your brain is producing each day. And is that different for everyone? Different for everyone. If you meet someone that's like a really high energy, excited person, they're going to be a slightly higher naturally baseline dopamine. If you meet someone that's a little bit like calmer, maybe they're going to be slightly lower. But everyone has the amount that their baseline dopamine will be producing. And when we live a life that requires significant amounts of hard work, so say you're someone that wakes up, you make your bed, you have your shower, you're quite disciplined, you work hard, you go to the gym, you put an effort with your family, you do things that are hard. Your brain is thinking, okay, this is someone that's going to require a significant amount of natural dopamine production because I need to support them to have the motivation to live this life they want. And gradually, when you live a life of effort, your baseline begins to rise and rise. And a high baseline dopamine feels like a very productive, excited, happy stay. On the other side, if you're waking up, you go into the social media, your food's crap, your booze is high. Effectively, when we're talking about revving that engine, you start burning out the production of it. And the brain goes, can't cope anymore. I can't, I can't produce. So the baseline begins to drop into a more apathetic stay. In a very similar way to how kind of type 2 diabetes works. You know, you eat too much sugar and fat and then suddenly your body can't produce insulin because you, you break the mechanism. We effectively type 2 diabetes in our dopamine. In so. the brain. <laughs> wow, that's so fascinating. Yeah. Um, but the amazing thing is that this thing recovers. I mean, it, it does. The recovery period, how long is that? You know, if, you, if you're changing how you bring dopamine into your life, how long does it take to recover that system? Yeah, so it depended on quantity of consumption prior to like the abstinence or the drinking less or however someone chooses to approach it. One thing that's really important to understand, and I talk to lots of people about recovery from drink or drugs or whatever it may be, is the brain will adapt to whatever it's experiencing. Like it's like, no, it knows that it gets dopamine from the phone or it knows it gets dopamine from the alcohol, whatever it may be. 
when you come away from one of these behaviors, there will be a withdrawal experience because the brain's like, oh, I don't have that dopamine anymore. So there will be a, a week or two weeks, depending on like quantity of consumption prior, where you actually do go into more discomfort because the brain's got very used to that experience. But once you come through the withdrawal, your brain starts going, okay, we're not going to get the boot. We're not going to get dopamine from booze anymore. We've got to start the natural production of this. And someone very close to me in my life, for example, has been very addicted to cannabis and that's really like a huge consumption. And they have been through a big withdrawal experience and cannabis really hits the serotonin system. But now their serotonin is beginning to naturally recreate itself and because it's no longer reliant on that drive to create it. And it's the same. Like after a period of time, the brain starts thinking, okay, we're not getting it from there. Let's re-kick in the engine FAC. Let's start producing this, uh, this ourselves. And then it starts to recover. And it can be fast. And especially like in a withdrawal time, when you're coming away from one of these addictive behaviors, if you can engage in some of the exercise or some cold showers or whatever it may be, one of these like dopamine enhancing behaviors, that is going to support because it's going to provide natural dopamine when you're not getting it artificially anymore. Yeah, amazing. So you just touched on a couple of those. Let's go through a few more. Um, cold showers is 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 huge for 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 that. Actually, let's just touch on that. Cold showers. Um, yeah, cold um, showers really uh, really fast way to surge the dopamine. Just for some context on those dopamine levels, we had the alcohol two x fifteen minutes to get there. Yeah. If you with uh, with cocaine, a more powerful drug, you've got a 2.5x increase and it will take about nine minutes to get there. So it's even faster spike, faster crash. And if you've in interacted with that, people may have interacted with that, you'll notice the big surge and fall. Cold showers is the only thing that this uh, psychologist called Shramek in the early 2000s found that it could also 2.5x the dopamine, the same as what the cocaine was doing. And it operates with a completely different side of dopamine. We can go into this, but it basically will last around two and a half hours. So you're looking at a really prolonged dopaminergic Lovely. benefit. So it's fast, but then has a longer well, tail. It's really interesting because how dopamine actually functions is it works on this system called your pain pleasure balance. And you've basically got this part of your brain called the hypothalamus. It's above like the roof of your mouth, if you imagine. So you can have some knowledge in your head right now. It's above the roof of your mouth. You've got this hypothalamus and in there is where dopamine is initially produced. And in there is also where you can experience pain and discomfort and you can experience pleasure and joy. And how it basically works, they work on a seesaw so that when we experience pain and discomfort, so for a hunter-gatherer, they're out there in the cold, fighting animals, trying to survive, ridiculously painful experience our brain would create a pleasure response and almost make us feel good. Because if we were just like, this is horrible, we'd give up effectively. So it has this mechanism where the seesaw tips towards pain, you're in a painful discomfort place and pleasure would rise. Okay, so you'd have like a good experience in your head. The difficulty now is we have the seesaw on the other side. So we're doing super high pleasure and our brain is trying to go, no, I'm going to make you feel like crap to reinforce not engaging with this. When you take something like cocaine or alcohol, it just spikes pleasure and then crashes, and the dopamine crashes. The cold shower actually goes the opposite way. It puts you into pain. And then as a result of going into pain, the body's like, oh shit, I've gone into pain. I'm going to put them into pleasure afterwards. And you have that Love prolonged, it. prolonged benefit because we are, as humans, really adapted to be able to deal with way more physical discomfort than we do now like we we actually survive I, yeah you can't even imagine surviving outside now like we'd all struggle to do like a day or two out in a forest <laughs> speak for yourself <laughs> true, true. <laughs> maybe you're capable and uh just hand me an axe and i'll sort everything out for you no. and if you came back from that trip with your axe you'd feel pretty good because your dose would be surging but the uh <laughs> Effectively, it's that opposite mechanism in action. It's pain and discomfort results in pleasure. It's the other side of the seesaw. There's somebody I need to introduce you to. Do you know the founder of Spartan, Joe DeSena? I don't think I do. Okay, I need to I need to get you on his podcast. Spartan. I imagine Obviously, he's he knows putting Spartan. people into pain. And that, yeah, and that's, in a all good he, way, that's, all, that's all he talks about. He's like, he's like we've all got too soft. Um, he, had, he had Dr. Anna Lemke on his, on his podcast, as we did. Um, we had on, on the podcast here and she talked about the pleasure pain balance and things like that. So I know he loves your chat. So uh, yeah, so I need a hammer at the desk and every time I need a little spike, I just smash my hand with a hammer. <laughs> will, will that help? That unfortunately won't help because the brain has a good survival mechanism where it will make you feel bad about hurting yourself <laughs> okay. in that way. That's Can't trick it that way. That's more self-inflicted pain. But, uh, we, need some, we need some. What are the what are the um, tools called to monitor dopamine levels in in brain, or is it uh, is it yeah? What do they do to 
monitor currently that. is a very complicated process to in immediacy measure dopamine you can measure it through like urine and blood but you wouldn't get immediate data really? you can use things like eeg and fmri but I would say society's understanding of, of these dopamine levels, like immediate understanding, like of how it's taking place is still in its infancy. And it's something I'm very excited about to be a part of over these next sort of few decades, because we're yeah. going to make a lot of advancement. We are. I mean, I hope one day the space. whoop on my wrist can yeah, exactly. uh, it will. measure my uh, dose and then Completely. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, and, and recommend and, and let you know and say you're low here and go for a run or you need to cool do have shower. some visions of how I'm going to create these things so we amazing. will see what's possible amazing <laughs> <laughs> um yeah you're in you're in such a cool space i'm i'm, I'm envious and, and anyways awesome okay um we've gone quite heavily into dopamine uh, really really interesting stuff so let's just jump over to you have this amazing acronym dose um it comes as part of what you're doing with neurofy just tell me those in detail and then we'll go through the others in a bit more detail yeah, and I think it's really cool for us to look at all of these through the lens of alcohol because that would be okay. uh, obviously unique to this this podcast. Great. But So you have dopamine and that's creating your drive, requires effort in order to create it. You've then got the O in dose, which is oxytocin. This is the human bonding chemical and uh, this is most predominantly released in a human when you're born. So in that moment of birth, your mum and you experience this massive surge of oxytocin that pairs bonds you together. Then you start having breastfeeding and all the physical touch and love in those first few months and oxytocin starts building, creating this deep desire for human connection within you. And human connection and being part of a group and a family is very, very important, particularly for humans, because in a jungle, a human on its own is gone. You've got no chance. We're not physically actually much of a predator, but as groups, we are extremely powerful. And this chemical effectively makes us want that group feeling of belonging. And anything that is moments where you're receiving love where you're giving love where you're contributing physical touch hugging cuddles sex all of that intimate experience of being a human that bonds you with people that is oxytocin really? and where alcohol creates challenges here is especially when you're drinking significantly it might significantly impact your relationships effectively and i'm sure many people have had that you might get more aggressive in relationships you might disconnect from relationships and that's where I think alcohol, yeah, it would significantly impact this chemical. Okay, so, um, but I, I imagine, I mean, for all of those things, right, alcohol leads to more sex for most people. I mean, that's how most people get sex in the first place, right? They find a lover through alcohol. Um, most people are drinking with friends because it's that sense of they've intrinsically linked alcohol to uh, probably the release of oxytocin and thinking that it's alcohol releasing it or that alcohol is aiding it, but actually what they're getting is from being there with a group of people and having a laugh and enjoying that company. I'm just making some assumptions here. You can These are good. Yeah, and then, you know, obviously increases physical touch, um, um, allows people to feel more connected, things like that. So there's probably quite a... Alcohol doesn't directly produce oxytocin. No, it doesn't no. directly produce it, nor does it directly reduce uh, reduce it either. It's not directly impacting the chemical itself oxytocin wouldn't vary as you have but, a drink but the but, things we are doing when we're drinking are increasing the oxytocin yeah, yeah. and I, I do think that's a real challenge i think we have created a society where social connection is predominantly based on the booze and it's something i have found extremely difficult like i now live about 45 minutes outside of london and a big reason a big component of that is I can't do the lifestyle that my friends all live. Like they love to get drunk four or five days a week and with how I want to feel and my work, I just couldn't do that. So I now live outside of London for that reason. And it is a real difficulty, the social connection. I think if you have like a glass of wine or two and you can have a little bit of the dopamine of the booze and connect, then it's okay. But once you take the booze far, you wouldn't even necessarily be getting as much like intimate oxytocin because you're eventually when you're actually drunk, you're talking over people. You're not really paying attention to what anyone's saying. You're just like in a an more animalistic form. And with that, I do want to go into some evolutionary aspects of the booze actually. But yeah, I would say it might be an oxytocin enhancer for a little bit of time at the start of the night, but then it's going to lead to more of just a, I'm pissed. I'm not really even paying attention. So I'm not getting the bonding. Yeah. But I mean, interestingly, we're all taking the short-term hit with alcohol right uh, we're all we're all i mean if everyone did the math properly on the impact that alcohol is having on them versus the positive is made nobody would drink 
Yeah, if you did like a cost benefit analysis. No, nobody <laughs> would drink. Nobody would drink. The hangover is much worse. The cost is much worse. The it, problems it causes is much worse. But it's so normalized. It's so socially acceptable. It's so driven all of those things that we, we, we ignore that stuff. Most people are. We do. We live in a world of wanting to feel good right now, basically. Like we're much more in the now. I, don't, I think lots of people don't necessarily have a, a bigger thing that they're wanting that they're really clear on in their life. Like I, I found for me, it's been, it's been really hard for me to get off all this dopamine stuff. Like I love it. It's really fun. All my friends are in Amsterdam, a festival this weekend, partying mm. really hard. I would have loved to be at that. I wouldn't love how I'd feel right now though, which is why I'm not there, which is why I didn't go. And I found the only way to, to uh, alongside the knowledge of the impact it has, the only way to truly have the capacity to sacrifice the pleasure right now is uh, having some kind of North Star goal that's bigger that I can chase down. And when I consider, for example, like right now I'm doing a lot of writing um, for a book and I actually had the analysis in my head. If I go to that festival, I'm going to feel shit for a whole week. I'm not going to be able to write. And then immediately I can sacrifice the festival because I've got this bigger thing I'm aiming towards. And I think for anyone that's seeking to come out of an addictive behavior, you've got to have something you're willing to sacrifice for. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so in our um, high, highest level program, Complete Control, um, there are 12 core drivers that drive compulsive behavior. Um, and that when you understand where you are on those and make those shifts in your life, you will be able to put yourself into a position where you can control it. Now, you are controlling your relationship with alcohol. Um, you've done things like change your environment, which is one of our core drivers. You've changed your environment in order for you to be able to be able to control it better because if you were still in London and you were still being booze handed by everyone, it would be difficult, right? Of course it would. You've changed some of your connections. You're now more aligned to people who are building businesses or going for success. You're networking with more people like that who are living how you want to live. Critical to being able to control behavior, right? You, um, you have meaning and purpose is absolutely key. So many people realize they're climbing the wrong tree, right? And you'll find this in, in, in organizations. I've spent 13 years trying to be the world's top oil broker. And then when I got almost to the top, I was like, what the fuck am I doing here? This is not what I'm supposed to be doing. Interesting. So I think there's there's all these factors. And I think you've been, you well, from what what we're showing, and you're coming from a neuroscience perspective and psychology background, and and we're coming from it for now from eight years of helping, you know, over 100,000, arguably many, many more um, people who change their relationship with alcohol. Let's pause just for a brief moment. I just want to share with you some of the heartfelt feedback from our incredible Complete Control community members. Listen to this. I I don't know how I signed up. I think I just got an ad on Instagram and just got a whim, just hit the button and did a call and then signed up and didn't really consciously think much about it. And then after that, I was like, what did I just sign up for? Wait a second here. Like far exceeded my expectations. I'm usually extremely skeptical, so I don't know how I even signed up in the first place, but whatever it was. Um, so it's just amazing how like the transformation that I've seen and even the drinking part is just kind of the super, it's, it was the Achilles heel, but it's kind of just the superficial problem. And it's like, once I kind of clear that up, there's so much more possibility and, and, you know, the exploration discussions with Gary, with Candace have just been so powerful and kind of, they both kind of focus on a different area. And then with Glenn kind of looking at my data and, with my co- cohorts or classmates or, you know, it's just been just, everything has just been so powerful and kind of supportive of, you know, completing the whole picture of how I do this. Um, so just really grateful and, and uh, yeah. And, and, and also just feel more grateful and not only just for all of you, but just, just in life in general, it's just a little bit more clarity and peace and calm and, and, and so forth. So I am incredibly grateful for this entire program, everybody on this call and everything that we were able to experience. Um, I think that it delivered more than I expected. Honestly, I, I, like I've said before, I've done a couple of like challenges and different things. And I think that this beyond um, examining my relationship with alcohol and making, I think, pretty good strides in, in, um, staying alcohol free. Um, I think it taught me a ton about myself and how to like examine my habits and my thoughts and those kind of, um, patterns and ways to, ways to approach 
the things that worried me the most in this in this experience um, have just been invaluable. I think I'm leaving feeling um, in stronger in general, more self aware in general, and um, just really more anchored in who I want to be and what my values are and how I can you know take better steps to achieve those. So it's been fantastic for me. And again, the, our team, I, I really um, appreciate all the feedback and support from every single person on this call, but my cohort as well. It's been great. So I love everybody that I've met here. I have loved the program. I am not a, an emotional person like this, but this has changed my life. It, it, it has given me a life. Um, and there's other things I need to do too, um, but I don't have to do them with the alcohol anymore. So thank you. It's been an amazing journey and a very, I appreciate the professionalism. Whenever I feel the stress, I, there's there's something that I can go back to, to everybody and the sharing from everybody and the professionalism of the program. So I loved it and I've grown a lot. So and kisses. one word is transformational. That's a word that's been bandied about for decades, but in this, it is absolutely accurate, if I was to use one word. This was a great investment. It's not, it's not self-help, it's self-realization. It's um, super powerful, but it, it exceeded my expectations. Or maybe it was Sharon who said that. Um, uh, or maybe I'm exceeding my expectations, and I like that. I mean, the program has been hugely, I'm hugely grateful for the program. I think the journey of, for myself has been amazing. I mean, I remember telling, I don't know if it was Candace or Gary, the first three or four weeks of the program, I was like, I can't stop thinking about not drinking. It's just, it's in my head. I'm ha Every day I'm thinking about not drinking. And it's, it's like now I'm not even thinking about it. You know, it's just like my life has sort of stepped on. I'm excited about the future. Um, things are looking good. Things are looking good. I just love sharing the things people are saying about our complete control program. Okay, let's get back into the episode. Right, so we've touched on oxytocin um, and um, that's really powerful into there. What about um, serotonin? Yeah, so serotonin is a really cool chemical and the alcohol is directly impacting this one. So this is the chemical that is being produced within your gut. And so 90% of it is produced there. A little bit is also produced in your hypothalamus. But you really want to think about this chemical as the chemical that's wanting your, you to take care of your body. And for hunter-gatherers, the body was instinctively cared for. It had rest. We slept a lot. So we just slept. It was dark. We had a lot of time out in the sunlight. We ate all the nutritious, natural foods that were around. And we couldn't really poison the gut in any way back then. However, now when you look at how our body is treated, we might lack a significant amount of sleep and rest. That's going to lead to low serotonin. Um, we might lack a lot of time out in the daylight. It's very easy as British people to know that our mood is directly connected with whether it's sunny outside and serotonin <laughs> is the neurology of why that is. That's why I live in New Yorker. <laughs> there you go. So you're getting a nice bit of serotonin off of that. And then most importantly with the booze, your gut is wanting great nutritious food to turn up. It's wanting fruits and it's wanting, well, nutrition is a big topic, but it's wanting good, natural, nutritious food to turn up and then it's going to go, brilliant, I'm going to be able to build serotonin out of that. And as a result of building serotonin, your mood and your energy levels are going to be great. And unfortunately, when the booze comes in, not only is it creating this spike and crash in dopamine, but it's coming into the gut and the gut is thinking, shit, I'm not going to, not only am I not going to be making serotonin out of that, that's actually going to reduce our entire function as a, as a, like a being within your stomach right now. Yeah. And this process is going to go towards, okay, how do I get the booze out instead of how do I build serotonin? And this dip in your mood, your energy levels, this is really connected to the alcohol sitting in your stomach effectively. There's something else in here, which I, I'm going to forget to ask if I, if I don't, or, or comment on it now. And I th <clears throat> think you'll probably align with this. Um, there are an awful lot of people out there who are going to a doctor um, uh, because they feel low or they feel depressed or they feel anxious or they feel sad um, and all of those things. Um, and the first port of call for a doctor or even the most psychiatrists is for you to take a medication, um, for taking medication. Um, and we're not talking about that here. We're talking about like the absolute basics, the absolute fundamentals. And I wish we could get this to be the first step. Like, why are people not prescribed 
Go do cold showers. Go and do some exercise. Spend some time with loved ones. Stop bloody drinking a poisonous depressant for you. Right? That, 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 is, that is one of the most powerful, psychologically manipulative drugs that is available in society or stat available in society. And let's start there first and then come back to me in two or three weeks and let's see how you feel. Right? Yeah, I think it is a... A real difficulty. I think it's multi-layered as to why we've chosen that route. I think an element of it is society just wanting a quick solution where a pill solves things for you. And as I said before, like we always like quick wins as a society these days. And that might seem like an easier route to take. I think medication can serve its purpose if someone's really, really in a very, very difficult spot. And it might be the thing that can stabilize them. But I definitely don't think it should be the first point of call. I think if if all of these things were in place and your relationships were good and you weren't drinking, you were getting good movement, your nutrition was good, you were working on your sleep, and all of it was really stabilized, and then you were like, wow, I feel awful, I'm super anxious and depressed, then maybe then it should be a consideration. But I think we're very much, we've got it flipped around. And... uh it is challenging. It is challenging for us as a society. I really hope that gradually we begin to realize how much connecting with the intelligence of our nature and just basically aligning to how your body wants to be treated is the initial solution. And there is some progress. New Zealand has green prescriptions where the first point of call is now a lot of times in natural environments, which is really, really cool. <laughs> Super um, cool. Japan has something called forest Japan bathing. has something called Shinrin Yoku, which translates to forest bathing, which another A great practice gets you moving, gets you into the sunlight, gets you out connecting with people. And yes, I do believe that should probably be the first point of call before the uh, the pills. Good. Thank you. Well, it was a very, very diplomatic answer, TJ. There you go. Well done. (laughs) That's my answer now. Wait till I'm about 35 and I really come into my uh, full... Like me. Full full perspective. I have my... We we can chat after about the full perspective. (laughs) Um, and when you get to my old age, you start to just call a spade a spade um, and uh, <laughs> worry about who you piss off later. Uh, endorphins was the one we were about to come on next. So the lovely dolphins. Nice. So just to run it back, we've got dopamine. We're doing hard things and that's giving us motivation and drive. we got oxytocin that's bonding us together, making us feel love and belonging. Serotonin, caring for our body, nutrition, sleep, time and sunlight. That's creating our mood and our energy. And then endorphins is, a, is another one like oxytocin. It's not getting directly hit by the alcohol. However, there is going to be a significant impact here. The reason we actually have endorphins, I think many people immediately associate exercise with endorphins, which is right. And the reason we have endorphins is say we're in the hunt-gatherer situation again, and we are faced with the ridiculously challenging situation of actually having to fight an animal or run away from an animal or fight a human. We basically needed to evolve and have a mechanism that in the in the moment of extreme physical and psychological stress, that an, a chemical would release within us to take the stress out of our brain and to take the physical pain we may experience out of our body. So that in that situation, you're about to have to fight a bear. I mean, if you're fighting a bear, it is lights out, unfortunately. But if you're, if you're fighting like it's tiny little sun, maybe you've got a chance. <laughs> <laughs> going to be hard to fight a bear, but... In that moment, it scratches you and all this stuff. You don't want your brain going, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, this is so scary. You just need to focus on survival. And similarly, you don't want to be thinking, ow, that really hurt my arm. You need something that's taking this away. And endorphins, they de-stress our brain and they take physical pain out of our body. And they're basically released when our body physically exerts itself. So when we're exercising hard, they release. When we're sitting in saunas, they release. When we're singing and dancing, that's a really good way to get the endorphins releasing. Which... You could associate that with stretching our body, really laughing yeah. is a big uh, endorphin-based thing. So our body basically wants to physically exert itself. And the wonderful thing about this system is whilst we're not necessarily having to cope with the stress of bears, our life now is still extremely stressful. And the biggest thing to understand is if your brain is in a stress state, the fastest way to de-stress it is going to be to physically exert it in some way, whether yeah, that's exercise, stretching, singing and dancing, sauna, anything like that is going to lead to these endorphins releasing and your brain thinking, oh, we're going in some kind of physical effort, release the endorphins, de-stress that person's brain. Interesting. Wow. Okay, so direct correlation between de-stressing and um, stressing your body. 
de-stressing the mind and stressing yes, the body we, through endorphins through the release of through endorphins. endorphins which is interesting you, you can just imagine like say you're in the extremely stressful situation of running away from a pack of animals or something you effectively need a mechanism that's going to help you cope with that stress and yeah. in that moment your body's going to physically exert itself very hard the interplay i'd see with alcohol here is for many people the endorphins are just extremely underactive because of a very sedentary lifestyle and alcohol demotivates us and leads to a much less exercise physically healthy lifestyle and uh, for many the endorphin system is so underactive and many people are struggling with this chronic stress experience but they're never doing actually the core behaviors that de-stress the brain i've just realized a way to help my whole team de-stress is like when they're all fully stressed out their mind and people are talking about burnout and things i can just dress up in a bear outfit and come running into the office <laughs> That is the solution. And maybe like <laughs> slightly scratch them. Oh, and then they'll get like a big endorphin <laughs> release. Them. Maybe i just get real bear. See what, no. Okay, let's move. If you could ever do a team day where you go like in saunas or something, that would be a good endorphin release. That sounds a bit better. Baths also have a good endorphin release. Like I'm sure people have experienced like you get in a bath and you suddenly feel like a, a de-stress come mm. over you. And that's your body. Although we know we're lying in some nice warm water and it's okay, the body's like, shit, I'm lying in really hot water here. Is this dangerous? And endorphins release. Yeah. So now um, we, we came up with this idea of this um, self-care smorgasbord, right? So not, you don't always want to do everything all the time. You don't, you know, consistency sometimes, right? So if you have a smorgasbord, 16 items, which you consider are self-care for you, right? Things like acts of giving or having a cold shower or, you know, uh, doing some exercise or meditating, breath work, right? So you've got 16 things on this. And you just look at it and you go, look, what four can I do today? Right? What, what four of those can I do? And, and, and at least they're moving me forward from a self-care perspective. Now, it sounds like you could, you could pull, similarly pull a whole list for the, for the dose here. When should you be thinking, now you've mastered this. So when should you be thinking, oh, I need to do something for serotonin? Or, oh, I need to, you know, are you teaching people to get more aware of when they need these chemicals and when they're deficient on them? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So the the key thing here, and as I said at the beginning, like I really have progressively began to see my life through the chemicals and it's been great for mental health and work performance and things like that. And it's really being able to identify with the symptoms of how you're feeling. And then the more you can understand the symptoms, the more you can figure out which chemical to boost. And in general, with everything to do with making progress with your health, say with alcohol, you have to have like a deep awareness of how it is actually making you feel and then yeah. you might be motivated for change. So spending time tuning into how you feel, I think is valuable. And effectively, you'd break it down into to four parts. If you're in a very demotivated, apathetic, can't be fucked state, effectively, that is dopamine. You need dopamine. So demotivated, you need the dopamine. If you're in a kind of lonely, isolated, I don't feel that connected to people state, you need oxytocin. If you're in a low mood, low energy state, and energy is different to motivation. Motivation is like your will, whereas energy is just like if you're just like tired yeah. and exhausted, yeah. low mood, you need the serotonin. And then if you're in a stressed state, you need the endorphin. So demotivated dopamine, lonely oxytocin, low energy serotonin, and stressed, you need endorphins. And I just like try and see it through that lens. Like say, for example, I can't really be bothered. I'm in a demotivated state. I need to do some work. One of the awesome things to build dopamine is actually the act of discipline and cleaning your environment around you. And you'll notice that if you clean up your kitchen or your lounge or something, you get a kind of a feeling of accomplishment and satisfaction. And rather than just trying to push myself through the task, I'll be like, I'm just going to leave it. I'm going to put some music on, which puts me into a bit of a good mood. And I'm going to go like clean the kitchen, sort out my bedroom, sort out my desk. And the act of that accomplishment will build some dopamine and then coming back to the task is going to be way easier because I'm going to have more dopamine abundance in my brain. So you and you can begin to just like play this like musical instrument of your brain chemistry effectively. That's amazing. I love that. It's super smart stuff that you're teaching people here. Okay, so tell us about Neurofight. Um, what are you up to? What are you doing? Um, and and yeah, tell us about Neurofight. Yeah, so Neurofy is a company I launched a couple of years ago. And the the primary thing I've been focused on is how do we get this education to people in a very impactful way that really works. And we've built this four-part training experience where we have one session on each of these chemicals. And 
It takes place over a month. It's hyper interactive and extremely good. We, we do extremely good for bonding companies together and connecting them on this whole topic of mental health through a very optimistic lens of chasing feeling good rather than like running away from anxiety and depression. And yeah, we do it in companies. We do it in schools. We have trained about 35,000 people now in the method over the last sort of 12 to 18 months. And it's pretty fun. It's, uh, I love delivering it. We're now kind of maxed at the delivery component of things. I've, I've, we're, we're booked to something like April next year. And now I've got to figure out the next stage as an entrepreneur of figuring how out to how we it. scale it into a, a platform. We've got some, uh, we have these 20 core behaviors um, of dose and we've just recently been going through a process of turning all these things I'm chatting about into these physical forms so companies and stuff like that can have them in front of them which is great for discussion and yeah I feel like dose is a cool method and I'm just trying to get it to as many people as I can love it and I'm, I'm super happy to share the message and um, we have a lot of business owners um, a lot of people who work at large organizations um, who listen to this podcast who are part of OMB who come into our program so um, yeah, I think it's really, really interesting what you're doing. Um, I already told you before that I think there's definitely some synergies. Um, perhaps we can we can help each other a bit more. And I just um, yeah, love love the stuff that you you're doing. It's super cool. Um, yeah. So any touch on booze lightly in dose, and uh, it'd be great to send people to you for the true booze training. I think yeah, it's exactly. Literally one of the most important things society needs is managing the booze. I think it's vital. So I think it's yeah. very cool what you do. Thank you very much. Um, and I think, you know, we're coming at it such a different angle from from most others now, um, having moved, you know, into a more wider market about being controlled. I think that's where the vast majority of people are, are looking um, at what they want. They want to be able to reduce down. And that's far more complex than getting just somebody to stop. It's much easier to stop. But I also, we didn't talk about this, but I also entirely agree with you that the, the best way for somebody to get a better relationship with alcohol is a period of abstinence. Like there's just no, we're not going to, we're not going to doubt that. But abstinence does not equal control. Um, and we've seen that for, for many, many people. So that's the importance of doing this work. And I think what you're doing here is so intrinsically linked into this part. I've learned a lot. You're going to help me improve some of our programs based on the, the conversations um, we've had today. So that's going to have a knock-on effect on everybody that we do work with going forward. So thank you for that. Um, and hopefully this is the beginning of conversations um, between us, TJ. So, Hank, any, any, any final thoughts or anything you want to share with anyone before we finish up? I would really like everyone listening to have a goal where this week they have to go on a walk without their phone. And if it's scary to go without your phone, just put it in a bag and have it on airplane. And you have to try and go on like a 40 minute walk in the quiet. And you have to ask yourself what's the number one thing that you want in your life right now and try and map out what the vision looks like to get towards that goal. Wow, that's cool. Okay, so homework for everyone, 40-minute walk uh, in some nature. Let's not do it in the city. Or if it needs to be a park. Yeah, it has we're in to be in a natural environment. It's got to be some to kind be of a park. No phone and go and think about... No phone. Yeah, think about what you want to do what's and the plan the number you're one get thing you want in your life? What is the number one thing? Ask it. Your instinct knows already, so it won't take long to come up with an answer, but it might be something you deeply want in a relationship. It might be to do with your career. It might be you need to work on your relationship with alcohol. It might be something to do with exercise. But ask yourself and ponder what a plan looks like. I think our instinct deeply knows the solutions to lots of our problems. I just think we're constantly distracting ourselves away from them. And the more time I think you spend out in the nature, in the quiet, and tap into your intelligent instincts, the, uh, the better your behavior becomes. Yeah. Amazing. There's so much we didn't touch on, um, but we, we're, we're running short time, so I need to get you back on again. So that's easy. Um, this is the first of many days. That would be fun, <laughs> Oh, and where does everybody find you? How do we, you're, you're prolific on Instagram, you're on LinkedIn. So yeah, share those. Yeah, LinkedIn and Instagram, definitely good platforms. If you just look at TJ and then Power, P-O-W-E-R. Instagram's my main platform. Lots of different ways in which you can learn guidance about how to optimize your brain chemistry over there fantastic thank you for the work you do keep going my man you're doing great stuff so um, <laughs> thank you mate well done all right thanks dj see you